Well, thanks for joining us this morning, whether you're tuning in on Zoom, watching on YouTube, or, uh, or helping out with the, the production of the service. We appreciate your attendance. I'm going to try leading a song here, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. It's 151 in the hymn book. Uh, when I say try, I mean I have no idea if, if I'm going to be on tune or not without an accompaniment, but uh, we're going to give this a go. So if, uh, if the production team would stand um, with me, and we'll see how... <laughs> Your voices are picked up on on the Zoom. No whispering. You guys got to sing as loud as you can here today. <laughs> All right, here we go. A mighty fortress is our God. A bulwark never failing. Our helper he amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing. For still our ancient foe doth seek to work us woe. His craft and power are great. And armed with cruel hate, on earth is not his equal. Did we in our own strength confide, our striving would be losing. Were not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing? Dost ask who that may be? Christ Jesus, it is he. Lord Sabaoth, his name, from age to age the same, and he must win the battle. And though this world with devils filled, should threaten to undo us. We will not fear, for God hath willed his truth to triumph through us. The Prince of Darkness grim we tremble not for him, his rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fell him. That word above all earthly powers, no thanks to them abideth. The Spirit and the gifts are ours through him who with us sideth. Let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also. The body they may kill, God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever. All right, thanks.
Thanks for helping me out there, people. I'm going to also just uh, do the Bible reading this morning. We're going to read from Psalm 90. Psalm 90, the whole chapter. Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Thou turnest man to destruction, and sayest, Return, ye children of men, for a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday when it is past. And as a watch in the night, thou carriest them away as with a flood. They are as asleep. In the morning they are like grass which groweth up. In the morning it flourisheth and groweth up. In the evening it is cut down and withered. We are consumed by thine anger, and by thy wrath are we troubled. Thou hast set our iniquities before thee, our secret sins in the light of thy countenance. For all our days are passed away in thy wrath. We spend our years as a tale that is told. The days of our years are threescore years and ten, and if thy... But, and if by reason of strength they be for score years, yet is their strength labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off, and we fly away. Who knoweth the power of thine anger? Even according to thy fear, so is thy wrath. So teach us to number our days, that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long? And let it repent thee concerning thy servants. O satisfy us early with thy mercy, and we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad according to the days wherein thou hast afflicted us, and the years wherein we have seen evil. Yet let thy work appear unto thy servants, and thy glory unto their children. And let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us, and establish thou the work of our hands upon us. Yea, the work of our hands, establish thou it. All right, um, I, uh, I guess I'll open in, in a word of prayer before calling the speaker up this morning. Dear Lord, I pray that um, there is a message that you want us to hear this morning, and I pray that it will be spoken through our, our guest um, speaker, that you'll open hearts to it, that you'll teach us what it is that we need to learn today. I pray that it will invigorate us, that it will convict us, that it will remind us that truth exists and the world needs this truth. And I just pray that you will work in us this week um, a work of reconciliation and love so that we can go forward as a unified church. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, please, uh, the pulpit's yours. Well, good morning, everyone, <laughs> and good morning at home, uh, everyone that is on Zoom. Uh, I would have really loved to see you guys in person, but I know that uh, we can't do it in maybe some of the circumstances that we find in ourselves 
today, um, but it is again a joy to be with you here today. It's been quite a while, probably been at least over a year, if not almost two years since uh, I found myself here in, in the pulpit, and it's always been a joy uh, to be with you guys. Um, it's definitely, I have good memories about all the time that I spent here, actually growing up when I came from Romania, for those that uh, remember, uh, with my family, I was able to be in this church for uh, a little bit and to be encouraged by you guys. Please, first of all, find my greetings, uh, receive our greetings from our church, uh, Cornerstone Romanian Canadian Baptist Church uh, from Abbotsford, and especially from myself and my wife Lydia, with whom I am with here today. Um, yeah, so it's just good to be together and uh, uh, come together around the, the word of our Lord. And, and thank you so much for reading the, the psalm. Um, that is what we're going to be looking at today. Now, I don't remember, it's been a while if I spoke from that psalm before, but I really enjoy that psalm. I really like that psalm. It really is a, is a psalm that uh, helps me meditate and think about my life and think about my God and think about my purpose. So I hope that today, wherever you are, that you would do that. You would pause for a minute and you would be able to meditate upon some of these things. Now, just the other day, my, my wife and I, Lydia, we were walking through a cemetery and uh, it reminded me of the days that when I was younger and the first time that I was walking through cemetery and I, it just kind of really hit me. There were all these people there and um, all their remains and I was thinking all these people had families and they had friends, they had careers, they had problems, they had, uh, you know, joys in their lives, whatever they did. But at one point, it ended up there. And if the Lord tarries, we know uh, that we will end up there as well. We know this truth well. Everyone dies. And I was faced with that reality um, when I was looking at that. And, you know, I always thought about this myself. Other people die. Every people, every, everybody else gets older. But for some reason, I thought that I would be able to escape from such a fate. Or I never really thought about it. But the, the, that is the truth. And we know it intellectually. But when it hits you and you realize that there will be a day that we will all take our final breath, it's something very profound. One day we are here and another day we are not. You know, and we see people die all the time, and especially this pandemic and what we've experienced over the last little while. It's been quite a difficult, uh, difficult thing to consider of just the deaths that have been uh, publicized more than normal, I would say, and they're just in front of us and, and people suffering and, and dying for what was going on. You know, and we, we hear about our neighbor down the road that passed away. We hear about our colleague that had a fatal car accident. We hear about some aunt or uncle. And again, we are reminded that we are all going to pass away at one point. So we go to funerals, we, we comfort people, and uh, after some time, things do get better. But like I said, there is that time and that uh, moment when we realize that we must also follow in the steps of our great-grandparents, our grandparents for some of us, our parents for others, um, spouses, children, etc. And there is really nothing we can do about it. But humans and people before us have tried to deal with this uh, over the centuries in different ways, but they were all failures, you know, from the search of the magical fountain of youth and elixir, attempting to concoct this elixir of immortality to uh, trying to increase our lifespan by fighting the diseases that plague us. And it's a good thing uh, to be able to help us in our diseases, but to try to unlock the genetic code and attempting to stop the decay of our flesh to even, you know, in the last couple of years, 10 years, probably finding ways to try to develop uh, and shed our fleshly body to download our consciousness into some supercomputer. I mean, this has been on the pages of news for the last couple of years, but all have tried and have failed. And the conclusion that we remain with is that we will pass away. And if people can't escape it permanently, this, this death, then what people do and what we do, and I know that I have done, and I challenge you to think that maybe you have done as well, is you try to escape this, 
dread of our death temporarily. Maybe we can find purpose somewhere else. We try to enter into relationships and we love and we try to, to love other people and for them to love us. We, we make memories and then we think about them often or we try to escape our reality to some form of entertainment. We use maybe alcohol or drugs that affect our sobriety and try to escape we read books to try to maybe somehow find our meaning in that. And we write books, we launch blogs, we start YouTube channels, and uh, we just try to live our life in a way that brings meaning. Other, some of us, we, we go to school, right? We follow that path, we, we get jobs, we try to climb up the corporate ladder, and once we make it high enough, we tell ourselves that it's all worth it. We get married, maybe. We got kids. We help the poor. We give to charity. We give from our time. We volunteer. And again, we are seeking purpose. But the truth is that no matter how many times and how many times we ignore this reality of our mortality, and guess what? The days pass, and we think more and more about it. Friends, there is a huge difference between us as creatures in our God. This is one of the biggest difference. Our God is the creator and we are the creatures. He is timeless and we are not. He is all powerful and we are weak. And we know these thoughts. They are not new from many people before us have thought about them. They are part of who we are. And here we are again today. Long time after Psalm 90 was written and we think and we resonate with the same words. And like we said, you know, Psalm 90 was probably written uh, by Moses. And if that's true, then it's probably the oldest psalm that we have. And actually, this would put it among the oldest writings in Scripture. You see, Moses, thousands of years ago, thinks about these things. Thinks about his mortality. Thinks about God's greatness. And thinks about his purpose in life. And while we do not know exactly for sure when in his time, in his lifetime, he wrote this. Scholars put this uh, during the time of the wilderness wanderings of the people of Israel uh, through the deserts. Right at the borders of, when, whenever they arrived at the borders of Canaan, after that, whenever they arrived at the borders of Canaan, and they turned around in fear, and they disobeyed God. They lost their trust in God and in his promises. So this psalm, as we are going to be looking at it together, is, can be broken in these two main parts. And in the first part, Moses reflects on God's eternity and on his and his people's mortality. And in the second part, Moses petitions God to give him wisdom and consider our, his limited existence to provide an answer to the question that he had and probably questions in all our lives. That is, what makes life worth living? I'm going to read uh, through the psalm because, again, I think it's important that we hear it again and we focus our minds on the word of God more than anything I'm going to be reading from ESV translation this morning. I hope that's okay. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations and before the mountains were brought forth or ever you had formed the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You return man to dust and say, return, O children of man, for a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday when it is past. Or as a watch in the night, you sweep them in the way as a flood they are like a dream, like grass that is renewed in the morning. In the morning it flourishes and is renewed. In the evening it fades and withers. For we are brought to an end by your anger. By your wrath we are dismayed. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. For all our days pass away under your wrath. We bring our years to an end like a sigh. The years of our life are 70, or even by reason of strength 80, yet their span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone, and we fly away. Who considers the power of your anger and your wrath according to your fear, to the fear of you? 
Friends, there's a lot of things here that we can learn, but just a few things to highlight. God is eternal. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, our God is eternal. God is creator. You return man to dust. Why? Because he is the one that brought him out of the dust. To God, time is irrelevant. He is outside of time. For a thousand years in your sight are but yesterday when it is past. As a watch in the night, that's about three to four hours. You sweep them away like a flood. As in, God, time doesn't stand a chance against you. It, 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 is, it, is, they are, it is overwhelmed by who you are. They are like a dream easily forgotten, like grass that is renewed in the morning and flourishing. In the evening, it fades away and withers. That's God. And then Moses says about man, for man, our life is like a sigh, like a breath. And at most, 70 to 80 for the strongest. But nothing in comparison to the, the, the thousands of years that uh, speaks about God here. And it's all about toil. It's all about trouble. It's about hard work, effort, problems, tragedy, pain. Soon gone and we fly away. And you know, Moses, as he writes this psalm, ventures to say that the real reason that this is so is because of our sin. A commentator says this, we have ever before men have ever before their eyes the fear of death, but God the sins of men. We are brought to an end by your anger, by your wrath we are dismayed. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. If we think about that for a second, let me share with you what somebody once told me. When I was younger, uh, kind of a youth, young adult, somebody came to me and said, Flavius, the next time you are committing a sin, I want you to imagine, not just imagine, but realize. But picture that you have been doing the sin and you have been just transported into the throne room of the Almighty God, in the presence of the, all the angels and before the throne of God and are committing your act of disobedience and treason right there and then. You see, as Moses says, our secret sins, they are not hidden. They are illuminated by God's presence. We cannot hide. Where will we go so that God's presence is not there? I've said this before. Man's biggest problem is not their physical sickness or loneliness or even death but it is that they are sinners in the hand of a holy and just God. Death is dreadful only when our biggest problem is not solved. Physical death is tragic only when it leads to eternal spiritual death and just punishment in the hand of such a God. And here's um, uh, what Luther speaks about this. Moses endeavors especially to teach men to fear God so that when they are in dread of God's anger and of death, they may humble themselves before him and become fit recipients of his mercy. And Luther continues, and in naming this psalm a prayer, he tells us that there is an antidote to death. He dwells upon the extent and power of death, and yet, along with its terrors, makes the hope of consolation to be felt, so that those who are terrified and humbled are not utterly brought to despair. That's right. God's people don't lose hope in the face of death. God's people aren't frozen with fear. We are not overcome with despair, for we have someone that we can pray to. The one that is called from everlasting to everlasting. The one to whom a thousand years is like nothing. The one whom created us from dust. He listens to our prayers. He listens to your prayers. So Moses dares to ask to bring his petition and his request to God. Verse 12. So teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. 
Return, O Lord, how long? Have pity on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love, that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, and for as many years as, you, as we have seen evil. Let your work be shown to your servants and your glorious power to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the works of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the works of our hands. Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. In the light of who we are, Lord, help us ponder our existence regularly to remember that we have a limited time here to consider the difference between who you are and who we are. Why? Why should we think about these things so that we may gain a heart of wisdom? You see, for the ancient people and especially for the Jews, wisdom is more than just knowledge or thoughts or intelligence. It is not just at the intellectual level for the Jews. The heart was not just a place of emotions, but the seat of our most basic orientation, our deepest commitments, what we trust most, what we love most, what we hope in most, what we treasure most, and what captures our imagination so when he asks for a heart of wisdom, it includes everything. Our thinking, our desires, our feelings, our actions. Lord, teach us how to live well. So Moses is asking God to teach us to know how to live well. How to not waste our lives what our motivations should be, what we should do with the years that we have been given, in whom we should place our hope, and in, in what we should find our satisfaction and pleasure. Since we are so limited, O oh Lord, teach us how to think, whom to desire, and what to feel, and what to do with our lives. When the Christian ponders God's holiness, God's greatness, and he ponders his own mortality. He gains a heart of wisdom. Return, O Lord, have pity on your servant, uh, Moses continues. Friends, when, when you truly love someone, you do everything you can to be with them, to enjoy their company, to spend time together. And when you are far apart, you cannot help but miss them, and your thoughts fly towards them. And I've heard this numerous times when people are close to passing. Most of them want to be surrounded by their family, by those who then love the most. In the same manner, Moses, pondering his existence in his old age, thinking about his sins, is asking for God's presence to come back to him, to come back to his people. He's had enough days and years without God's special, close intimate presence he wants him back he wants to see God again and then he says this and this is really my favorite line from this psalm Lord satisfy us with your steadfast love that we may rejoice and be glad all of our days how many those would be you want Happiness, you want joy, you want gladness, you want satisfaction in your life, then look for it in God's steadfast love. For God created his people in such a way that they would only find their full fulfillment and satisfaction in their creator. There is this hole in our hearts that can never be filled by anything else but our creator. We may try to do that, filling it with things and people, but all of them will let us down sooner or later. Here's what C.S. Lewis says in Mere Christianity. The Christian says, Creatures are not born with desires unless satisfaction for those desires exist. A baby feels hunger while there is such a thing as food. 
A duckling wants to swim. Well, there is such a thing as water. Men feel sexual desire. Well, there's such a thing as sex. If I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. No one knows what satisfies us best than the one that has created us. Yet God created us for his glory. And everything around us, the whole universe, including ourselves, are created that we may bring him glory. But that doesn't mean, friends, that we have to be miserable here in the lives that we live. And I'm, I'm not sure if any of you, I'm, maybe you have heard of hedonism. And that is the idea of the pursuit of pleasure, of self-indulgence. And it is this... Uh, ethical theory that pleasure is in the sense of satisfaction and of all our desires, the highest good and the proper aim of human life. Just do whatever makes you feel good. And since we're surrounded by this corruption of the world and we have seen how the pursuit of pleasure can lead us to idolize it, as Christians, we stay away from it many times. So we then think that while we can be happy, we shouldn't be too happy here for if this world makes us happy, then why should we be looking forward to the next? But who said that we must find our ultimate happiness in this world? My dear friends, let me free you of that burden and tell you that you are free to pursue happiness. But the only place that you will find the fulfillment, the full satisfactions, would be in the arms of your Creator. So please, yes, pursue that every minute every hour, every day, for as long as you live. Seek after God. Look towards Him to fulfill you. And ask Him, as Moses did, to satisfy you every morning. Um, St. Augustine said in his uh, book, Confessions, Great are you, O Lord, and greatly to be praised. Great is your power and your wisdom infinite. And you would praise man? Man, but a particle of your creation. Man that bears about him his mortality, the witness of his sin, the witness that you resist the proud. Oh, but if man would praise you, he but a particle of your creation. And in the famous words, you awaken us to delight in your praise. For you made us for yourself, and our hearts is restless until it rests in you. Friends, Christian hedonism is different from what the world sells to us. We don't make a God out of pleasure, but we realize that we make a God, uh, or um, we make a God, we idolize the person or think that we enjoy most. For Christians, that can only be God and nothing else. So you want meaning and purpose in your life? You want satisfaction? You want fulfillment? You want joy? Come and feast on the steadfast love of God. And quote, as you know, uh, Moses speaks here, the evil that you had to suffer through your life will be overwhelmed by his beauty. And the things of this world, as the song says, will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Moses continues here, close to the end. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. But what better motto to have every morning when you wake up than that? May his favor be upon us. May we be honored by his presence. May we see God's work in a mighty way every day. May he do that in your life, in my life. And may we see God's work in a mighty way every day in our churches, right? In our families, in our communities, in our province, in our country. We make plans and sometimes we see them come to fruition and other times we do not. But Moses is asking of God we should, that we should do the same. Establish the work of our hands. Without you, O Lord, may we do nothing. Please build the foundation 
upon which our plans stand, Lord. For we know that unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. So yes, we are people, we are creatures, we are humans, we are limited. We will live for a brief period of time. And if the Lord tarries, we will die. And thinking about this reality uh, and thinking about this, friends, is healthy. For it focuses our thoughts and our lives on the things that are truly important. So may this be the day that you spend some time thinking about your mortality. Spend some time thinking of God. For that is the highest thoughts you can have. Spend some time thinking, confessing your sins to find forgiveness of the biggest burden that you possibly have at the foot of the cross based on the work of our Lord and Savior Jesus. And come before the mercy seat of God with boldness and dare to pray for the creator of the universe would love to listen to you and ask him for wisdom. Say, Lord, I want to live well. I want to live a life that honors you. I want to fulfill the purpose for what you have put me here in whatever circumstance I find in myself and what in my life. You know, for whatever, you know, wherever I am, whether I am single or not, married with kids, without kids, whether I am in pain and suffering, whether I am sick, whether I am at the beginning of my journey or close to my end, teach me, Lord, how to live well and ask Him to bless you with His presence. My dear brothers and sisters, may you find satisfaction in joying God in His steadfast love. Steadfast. That's unmovable. It, it's amazing. You can trust it every day, every moment. Ask him to show you his mighty power as he works in your life, as he grows you, and as he molds you in the person that he wants you to become and helps you to perfect your life, to, to, to sanctify you, to remove, the, to eliminate the sin that has been lingering in our lives. Ask him for his favor every morning and ask him to bless your work, the things that you will do today, the things that you will do tomorrow, the plans that you are making. May God establish them according to his will. May the Lord bless you uh, and keep you. It's been so good to be with you again this morning. I just wanted to encourage you with that psalm. Uh, like I said, it is an, a psalm of encouragement and um, reflection for me. And it's been uh, one that it's been very um, useful for me over the last couple of years, just considering my life, thinking about the future, thinking about what is the Lord, what does he want me to do? Um, and I want to encourage you to do the same thing. Turn your eyes, turn your eyes towards our Lord. That's where you're going to find your answers and not in this world. May God bless you and hope to see you all one day all together and rejoice and be able to loudly sing praises to our God and also to uh, surround each other uh, and as we are opening God's word. God bless you. Amen. Well, thank you, Flavius, for coming out and giving us message this morning. Um, it was good to be able to meet again with some of our um, friends from the Romanian world. <laughs> we, uh, we really appreciate that. Um, I uh, would like to, uh, I guess, try and lead song for the end here. Uh, it's 408, How Firm a Foundation. Um, I have a voice, but it may not be in tune, but we'll try. It's 408, how firm a foundation.
How firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he hath said, to you who for refuge to Jesus have fled. Fear not, I am with thee, O oh, be not dismayed, for I am thy God and will still give thee aid. I'll strengthen thee, help thee, and cause thee to stand Upheld by my righteous, omnipotent hand When through fiery trials thy pathway shall lie my grace, all sufficient, shall be thy supply. The flame shall not hurt thee, I only design thy dross to consume and thy gold to refine. The soul that on Jesus hath leaned for repose, I will not, I will not desert to his foes. That soul, though all hell should endeavor to shake, I'll never, no, never, no, never forsake. Amen. Go in peace.